This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Fruit Loops, episode 174. Bienvenidos, bitches. Bui tibi nafi. And thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Now, Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and the victims that we don't hear or know much about. Contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgendered, white dudes. What? They're just not. No, I'm telling you. And there are many well-documented cases of serial killers of color, and Fruit Loops is a podcast all about them. We will take deep dives into the fascinating lives and crimes of serial killers and true crimes committed by people of color and the victims that the media and entertainment commonly leave out because, oh my God, this is terrifying. The news is racist. (laughs) Allegedly. (laughs) Happy Halloween, (laughs) y'all. And we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth, and I just happen to be white. We forgive her and love her so much. (laughs) We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists. Just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Mm -hmm. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. Please send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or... Leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. And we may feature it on a future episode. Also, our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all our social media. The fruit nuts for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops Patreon. Yeah. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors. So Please do. Who are we talking about today, Beth? Well, today we're talking about Alonzo Robinson and the Toledo Clubber. Oh, me, oh, my. <laughs> Lions and tigers and bears. Alonzo, oh, my. <laughs> Robinson was a black man, a grave robber, a murderer, and a cannibal. No. His story is said to be part of the inspiration for the character of Hannibal Lecter on Silence of the Lambs, the Whoa! book by Thomas Harris that was made into the movie of the same name. Wow. And there may or may not be a link to a perpetrator in Ohio dubbed the Toledo Clubber. So we've got a mystery for y'all. All All right. Well, well, before we get into it, how you doing? I'm all right, you know, staying busy. But I wanted to be sure and say happy Halloween to our fruities out there. Yes. Happy Halloween, y'all. Stay away from blackface and Jeffrey Dahmer costumes. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. And then you can have a happy Halloween. Now, uh... Um, did I mention how much I love Halloween in the South? Yeah. Uh, this season. <laughs> I'm jealous. And, oh, I never imagined. First of all, I've never been to a pumpkin patch where the pumpkins are actually growing from the vine and you can cut them off. Wow. But, that's cool. Yeah, I've never seen a pumpkin like g- sprout out actually of the ground growing. before. <laughs> I, it it was it's it blew all of our minds. It, oh my god! It was just so get those that jack o' lanterns and, on vines. What these are plants? Oh my god! Does every, did everybody know that? Oh my god! So <laughs> hey, did you guys hear about this? Uh, so anyway, so get those jack o' lanterns ready, y'all. So yeah, um, yeah. So happy Halloween to everybody out there listening. Thanks for being with us. And yep. with that said, let's get into some listener letters. Well, hello, angels. Thank <sighs> you. Oh, 
Okie dokie. What's in that bag, Beth? Well, the angels handed me this empty bag. We got nothing in the mailbag this week. You sons of bitches. Is this a <laughs> Halloween prank? Is this, a, is this where the trick comes in instead of the it's, treat? Uh, what, Devil's Night? <laughs> yeah. We're going to set the mailbag on fire. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd love it if you could take a minute to give us a five-star review. We would so very, very yeah. much. Um, we got a new Patreon this week. Um, right. So shout out to um, Shatavia H. And if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm so sorry. I'm going to give you a hip hop air horn right now, though. <laughs> and hope that you enjoy this. Very superstitious. Leaves about to fall. <laughs> We podcast and stream shit we don't understand. Then we thank you. Shatavia, thank you, babe. <laughs> 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 Good one. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you all so much. Yeah, uh, thank and you. we're going to take a quick break and get into the story when we come back. All right. It was a night like any other. I was just hanging out with my pal, Rhaenerys, and she was all like, dragons, war, <laughs> duty, bloody, freaking blah. And I was like, come on, Ray Ray, not the dragons again. I can't. And then suddenly I was just gone. My pals at the Red Keep and King's Landing may wonder about my mysterious disappearances, but they don't need to worry because if you're having as much fun with Best Fiends as I am, it's no secret why you sneak off to play. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> don't worry about it, Beth. Look, the point is this. Best Fiends is where it's at, right? Best Fiends is a free to download mobile puzzle game with thousands of exciting levels for new adventures and challenges every time you play. I'm on level 610. Holy and it, cow. <laughs> it's, it, I blew myself away. <laughs> it's just a nice distraction. It's a good brain workout. It's a getaway. And it's so fun to win and get rewards. Now, tell me, what level are you on, friend? You are still kicking my butt. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm on level 490. 92. But wow. you know what's important? What? Just that I'm having fun. Amen. And with Best Fiends, there are thousands of levels and dozens of unique fiends to collect. So you can customize your team of fiends to defeat menacing slugs. Power up your favorite fiends to new levels for even more powerful skills and watch them transform as they get stronger. And with offline play, Wendy's favorite, uh -huh. <laughs> you'll never be stranded without fun even if you lose your internet connection. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Now download your favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R best fiends. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read. We're back! <laughs> <laughs> Remind us, Beth, who is our subject today? Our subject today is Alonzo Robinson and the Toledo Clubber. Robinson was a grave robber, murderer, cannibal, oh. and local boogeyman in author Thomas Harris's hometown of Rich, Mississippi, oh. located outside of Robinson's hometown of Cleveland, Mississippi. And his oh. story is said to be part of the inspiration for the character of Hannibal Lecter in Harris's book, Silence of the Lambs. And there wow. may be a link to a perpetrator in Ohio who's been dubbed the Toledo Clubber. And that, not that kind of clubber. He's not, like, <laughs> dancing. No. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> no, he's clubbing people in the head. <laughs> okay. Now, have you read the Hannibal book or this author, Thomas Harris? Never heard of him. Yeah, he wrote the book, Silence of the Lambs, and uh, they made the book, the movie out of his book. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't remember if I read Silence of the Lambs, but I did read one of his other books that was like a precursor to Silence of the Lambs. And I can't remember what it was called. Red something, something. Red Dragon. I think it was Red Dragon. Oh, 
okay. I think that was made into a movie too. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. And it was all right, but I love Silence of the Lambs. Love it. Me too. Me too. It's one one of my my top tens. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I have to watch Watch it. Watch it. Season. Yes. Um, all right. Well, let's get into some stats, shall we? Now, Alonzo Robinson, a.k.a. James H. Coiner, William Coiner, and Ed Grayton. Uh, the press called him, get ready for this, a giant Negro mm. and also a giant Negro ghoul mm. uh, and a huge colored grave robber. Uh, and mm. did I mention the news is racist? <laughs> it was very racist oh, back then. <laughs> boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Now, the crimes took place from 19. 19- 26 to 1934 in Michigan and Mississippi. There were two to six murder victims. So rest in power to the victims and all the communities affected by these crimes. Um, He was sentenced to death by hanging after he was apprehended in January of 1935. So now we're going to get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. Well, this is going to be a little bit different. We're going back in time. Okay. Going back a hundred years to the oh. early 20th century. Uh, what was it like back then? Well, here's a scary story. Record scratch. I'm already <laughs> terrified. <laughs> Black people don't fuck with going back in time. No, thank you. Because <laughs> uh, wasn't, the past wasn't good. isn't yeah. always exciting or fun to relive. So yeah. Yeah. here we go. Here we go. <laughs> At the turn of the 20th century, the use of fingerprints to identify criminals was still in its infancy. More popular was the Bertillon system, which measures dozens of features of a criminal's face and body, and it recorded the series of precise numbers on a large card, along with a photograph. Hmm. In 1903, a convicted criminal and black man named Will West was taken to Leavenworth Federal Prison in Kansas. The clerk at the admissions desk, thinking he recognized West, asked if he'd ever been to Leavenworth. The new prisoner denied it. The clerk took his Bertillon measurements and went to the files, only to return with a card for a William West. Well, it turns out their Bertillon measurements were a near match, and Will and William bore an uncanny resemblance, and I saw their pictures and they looked like the same man. Wow. It was really weird. Yeah. You know what's qu- weird? Just I was just before I sat down here was watching the movie Us. Really? And <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was his doppelganger. <laughs> yeah. And they, they may actually have been identical twins. I uh, oh, don't really okay. know. Okay. But the clerk asked Will again if he'd ever been to prison. Never, he said. When the clerk flipped the card over, he discovered Will was telling the truth. Hmm. William was already in Leavenworth, Whoa. serving a life sentence for murder. Soon after, the fingerprints of both men were taken, and they were clearly different. The next year, Leavenworth abandoned the Bertillon system and started fingerprinting its inmates. Wow! Progress! <laughs> <laughs> and with this kind of technology, how could any innocent person be convicted or even executed for Right. Crime they didn't commit. <laughs> Me? No. <laughs> and this is just an example of how investigations at the time were hobbled by the lack of modern tools and training and how easily an innocent person could be locked away or even executed. Yeah, it's scary to it think. It is. Now, it reminds me of the issues with AI to this date Yeah. Um, and people getting wrongly identified. And part of the problem today, which I th- imagine is part of the problem with the system back then, is that the system system was created by a homogenous group of people mm-hmm. who hadn't considered differences. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and the 1920s was a period of rapid economic growth, momentous changes in American society, and increasing affluence for some Americans. The decade's nickname, the Roaring Twenties, is still used to suggest the seemingly easy free life that some Americans live in. It was an era of such industrial giants as Henry Ford, whose popular Model T automobile helped end the isolation of rural life, giving people more personal freedom. The decade also witnessed the boom of jazz and of uninhibited dance crazes, such as the Charleston. Oh, yeah. Now, silent films gave way to the 
the talkies or movies with synchronized sound. Oh, my God. In 1919, after World War I, the U.S. government lifted a ban on civilian radio ownership and transmission. And it wasn't long before commercial radio became a favorite source of entertainment. It was the decade that marked the start of a shift from the rural small town values of the 19th and early 20th centuries to those of the more urban, industrial, and technological world of today. And the overwhelming impression that most people have is that it was a period of unequaled prosperity and freedom shared by everyone. Yeah, it's really interesting to me when people are like, Ooh, I'm having a party. It's Roaring Twenties themed, and I'm never interested in being a part of it. <laughs> so for many Americans, the 1920s was a decade of poverty. More than 60% of Americans lived just below the poverty line. Wow, that is yeah, a lot. That is a lot. Um, shame on you, U.S. government. <laughs> now, these folks did not enjoy the prosperity of the quote-unquote Roaring Twenties. Roaring Twenties. <laughs> Get out of here. In 1919, the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was passed. The amendment forbade the manufacture, sale, or transportation of alcoholic beverages. But attempts to curb alcohol started long before the 18th Amendment. In 1826, the American Temperance Society was formed. And in 1873, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, or WCTU, was founded. The temperance movement's most forceful voice. Yeah, but as a a little culture corner here, so as somebody who's on a recovery journey, per se, as you as as I would refer to it, um, I learned there was a black temperance movement and that Frederick Douglass was the first prominent recovering alcoholic in America wow. and the leader of this black temperance movement. And you're not going to believe this, but chattel slavery, racism, and being black in America were traumatizing to Douglas what? and other black people. Get out. You don't yeah, say. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, and sometimes human beings, when they are traumatized, turn to substances like alcohol to yeah. deal with it. And actually n- nearly every major black abolitionist at the time that this is it WCTU um, movement began? Nearly every black abolitionist and civil rights leader before World War I, including Frederick Douglass, but also Sojourner Truth, um, Ida B. Wells, W.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington endorsed temperance and prohibition. The WCTU proposed the ban of alcohol as a method for preventing abuse from alcoholic husbands. And uh, yeah, it was a it was a problem. Yeah. <laughs> The push for prohibition gained momentum, often with women and Protestant congregations leading the way. Then World War I came, and with it, a temporary wartime prohibition in order to save grain for producing food. There was also a pronounced anti-German sentiment, and since many brewers were German, the support of the ban on alcohol grew. Of course! Yeah. On December 18th, 1917, a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol was proposed in the Senate, and in October 1919, Congress passed the Volstead Act, or National Prohibition Act. The country went dry at midnight on January 17th, 1920. That feels like it must have been so like weird. Yeah, yeah. Like wait Almost a minute. Almost like the the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Taking away all our fun. <laughs> With what? The, you, I can't leave my house. Uh, what? Yeah. So of course prohibition didn't prevent people from drinking. Mm-hmm. The wealthy, including many politicians, bought out the inventories of the retailers and wholesalers, and an entire black market with bootleggers, speakeasies, and distilling operations emerged as a result of prohibition, as did organized crime. The prohibition era was a period of gangsterism characterized by competition and violent turf battles between criminal gangs. In addition, corruption in law enforcement was widespread as the Mm. criminal organizations used bribery to keep officials in their pockets. Prohibition also eliminated jobs in what had formerly been the fifth largest industry in America. I can only imagine that some of these folks uh, probably turned to bootlegging or illegal distillery. Yeah. Yeah. What are they going to do? People yeah. still got to eat. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, and, and and it's kind of interesting, this um, soup of gangsterism, because gangs were created to 
protect the neighborhood um, and law enforcement being wrapped up in that and this bribery and politicians like it's all it's all like it's just all weird, part of an organism like, web. Yeah, yeah. yeah they and none and none can function without the other if you really think about it so um, yeah it's a fun little game we play in America. <laughs> <laughs> so the five families of the New York mafia emerged during this time and African-American organized crime flourished as well. Centered in New York's Harlem, where the numbers racket was, it was largely controlled by Casper Holstein and Stephanie St. Clair. More on her in a future episode. Yeah. Hello, I yeah, cannot she wait. fascinating. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, God. I'm so excited. You know that girl? I'm so excited to meet. Ooh, that's me right now. Okay. Back to this one. <laughs> By 1933, an assortment of dangerous and criminally prolific gangsters were wreaking havoc across America, especially in the Midwest. Oh. On December 5th, 1933, prohibition was repealed at the federal level, but mm. organized crime persisted, extending to narcotics trafficking, gambling, sex work, racketeering, loan sharking, and extortion. Way to go, America! <laughs> America! You're gonna, you're gonna be so sick of winning. You know what's interesting is... The Midwest is forever baffling to me. But when you look at a map, I mean, the Midwest really is kind of like the center of... It's not the West. Yeah. It's Yeah, it's the... it's But it's, you know, like I, I'm a big fan of Ozark, right? And I'm like, why in the fuck would people... Would Mexican cartels be doing all this business in the mid-fucking-West? Have you been there before? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that fire um but it's an but i easy think chicago place. is Ch considered yeah. midwest midwest it's a yeah. hub it's a, a hub and it's easy to get in and out of there and go to other other places and there's a lot of highways and byways that go through there so it makes sense that crime might flourish in a place in like that, that area yeah yeah so the 1920s saw bank robbery kidnapping auto theft gambling and drug trafficking became more common crimes by 1926 more than 12,000 murders were taking place every year across america oh no <laughs> do a true crime podcast about that <laughs> <laughs> on august 18th 1920 the 19th amendment was passed giving women the right to vote but they mm. still could not serve on a jury in fact the specter of female oh jurors God. was wow. used by opponents of the women's suffrage movement who warned that giving women the vote quote means women on juries Unquote. Oh my God! Terrifying! Oh my God! <laughs> they have uteruses! No! No! Oh my God! Wow! I just—that's what I'm saying. I don't understand. Why would anybody be interested in going back in time? <laughs> I can't vote. What? I can't be on a jury. Anyway, although the Civil Rights Act of 1875 enacted during Reconstruction gave black men the right to serve on juries, the law was not effectively enforced, particularly in the South. For example, in 1898 Louisiana, lawmakers amended the state's constitution to, quote, establish the supremacy of the white race, unquote. And yep, they said the quiet part out loud. And yep. I... I I just have to remind everybody, please go vote. <laughs> yeah. Please vote. We don't want to go back to no, the 1920s. We, we, sure we don't, don't. want to do that. No. <laughs> No. The new constitution diluted the participation of black jurors by stating that as long as nine out of 12 jurors voted to convict, a felony conviction was permitted. This wow. meant that if three black jurors voted to acquit a black defendant, the other nine white jurors votes were still enough to convict. And wow. I bet that there were never any more than three black jurors on the panel. Yeah. You know what that reminds me of is the three fifths compromise. Oh, yeah. It's like it's like yeah. at, at, at every, at every time turn america refuses to see non-white people as people. human beings <laughs> yeah whoa okay so the law effectively made the participation of black people on juries meaningless <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's my evil halloween laugh and this, despite its explicitly stated purpose to maintain white supremacy this practice was not struck down by the supreme court until what 2020? Yeah, 2020. <laughs> I hate it here. May I be excused? <laughs> so the 1920s were great. <laughs> if you were a straight white man, woo! So for women, 
gay people, people of color, not so much. Yeah. I, are you sensing a theme here? <laughs> <laughs> and when you think of 1920s women's fashion, you probably have an image in your head of the flapper style featuring knee length hemlines, shocking oh my, so shift style Scandal. garments, <laughs> and bobbed haircuts. Corsets were no longer worn, replaced by bras and girdles. No, but women in many parts of the country still faced stifling clothing restrictions. Thousands of women were arrested and fined for breaking laws that regulated their clothing. And I don't know why. The more things change, the more things sound the same. And it I happens know. everywhere. It's, this it's, reminds it's me of Iran. Like we're talking about uh, today. Yeah. Just slightly yeah. different. Yeah. Yep. Just a yep. little bit different. And now there were also laws prohibiting people of any gender wearing, quote, the dress of the opposite sex, unquote. Wow. And in spite of what seemed like a social revolution in the 20s, the traditional view of the American woman was still tied to home and family. Mm. Women entered the workforce in large numbers during World War One. But after the war, of course, as the men yeah. returned home, the workplace restrictions made it difficult for women to find jobs outside of the home. So, quote unquote, protective laws regulated how, when and where women could work. Huh? Forty seven percent of college students were women. But many businesses refused to hire women and legally could do so or hired women only for office positions such as secretaries, stenographers or lower paying service positions, even if they held a degree and were qualified for higher positions. And I remember somebody saying to me when I was in college that her mother went to college to get her MRS degree. Her Mrs. Degree. Oh, I'm like, what is an MRS what? degree? Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. that's interesting. Yeah, Ooh. that is true. A lot of women did go to college to find men. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. I mean, no, it's not. Well, but they, it's, they, they couldn't get jobs, you know? Right. So what how else, else are gonna you going to, you, you know, be safe and secure right. and right. S get social stability? It yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. In 1927, bathrooms became officially gender segregated thanks to the nation's first building code. Mm. In some cases, women were barred admission to schools or jobs based on the fact that there were not toilets available for their use. And how could that possibly be abused? <laughs> oh, wow. I'm I'm like, uh, uh, that is baffling. What? That's wild, right? Yeah. So women's magazines regularly told stories of women giving up careers or personal achievements in order to return home and domesticity as they should was the implication. But note, the magazines only marketed to white women working at right, home right. and depicted images of happy white ladies working at home. Women of color were nowhere to be found in these magazines. Yeah. And I think this didn't all of this stuff didn't apply so much to black women because black women were probably expected were working. to work. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're working. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Just wanted to point it out. That's the only right. reason we're there. Yep. <laughs> And they were not working, uh, you know, jobs where they could make a lot of money. <laughs> right. It was it was service. It was service, service and jobs. domestic yeah. jobs. Yeah. Yeah. In 1924, Congress passed a law that made all Native Americans citizens of the United States. Gee, wow. thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Did you know that I already have <laughs> a already nation there. and culture? Thank they were you. here before you were assholes. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but even then, many could not vote because of the literacy qualification. They were not allowed to have their own courts or control their own affairs. And there was not literacy qualifications for white Americans. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, um, That's nuts. only Only to people who were not white. Point. So many young Native Americans were forced to go to boarding schools, the aim being to destroy their traditional way of life and assimilate them into white culture. Uh, but we already they already had a culture. Yeah. Oh, that makes me so mad. So in 1920, over 10,000 Native American children were educated. I use that term loosely, loosely educated yeah. in boarding schools away from their reservations and families and communities. And much of American life was racially segregated by law. Social customs emphasize the inferiority of people of color in society and racial intolerance influenced all aspects of their lives. And all of the social and cultural changes that occurred in the early part of the 20th century freaked white people the fuck out. Oh, my God. Yeah. Just chill. Just like now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, yes. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Religious fundamentalism revived, 
fear of radicals and foreigners combined to completely close off America to immigration and contributed to the resurgence of hate groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. Just like today. Just like today. How do yeah. people not see this? I don't I, know. I, I don't know. Oh, and uh, in 1920, the United States had 12 million black Americans, 75 percent of whom lived in the South. Most black Americans in the South were sharecroppers who suffered when agricultural prices fell throughout the 1920s and early 1930s. Three quarters of a million lost their jobs. But the Harlem Renaissance also happened during this time. Black Mm. musicians, visual artists, and writers were able to achieve great fame and notoriety for their work during this period. Black students were establishing fraternities and sororities on college campuses. New organizations were being founded to support Black Americans in the fight for equality. Black politicians were elected, and the world of professional sports saw Black players making history. Yeah, that's good things. Yeah, progress. Yeah, a little step forward, a step back. You know, step forward, a step back, and there's always a tipping point, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And there's some arc of something good that um, bends <laughs> towards something, something good, but it's really it takes a really long, long time. time. I that's... don't know the court, the quote. I'm not that smart, but you get it, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Somebody's like banging on the steering wheel. When do you get this quote wrong every, every time? Every time. <laughs> So at the at the same time, because white folks got skirt got scurred, black communities were ravaged by riots, subject to racism and discrimination in every way possible, and under the near constant threat of the highly active Ku Klux Klan and other hate groups. And by the way, the hate groups existed all throughout society. I mean, they the hate the members of the hate groups were. It worked it. They were doctors. They were dentists. Yep. They were teachers. They, they were, were police, police officers and police yeah. and politicians. They were every everywhere. Yeah. As black soldiers returned from Europe after World War One, and southern black folks migrated to northern cities by the thousands, racial hatred escalated to new extremes of virulence and destruction. As white people resisted black advancement, this period saw the most horrific racial riots in U.S. history to that time. And incidences of lynchings increased. Toward the end of the decade, in October of 1929, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression had begun. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Oh, no, (laughs) it does not. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Look, it can be tough to train your brain to stay in, quote, problem-solving mode, unquote, when faced with a challenge in life, as opposed to my boss didn't say hi to me today, and now my job is in jeopardy, and I'm an imposter anyway, so I'm probably going to get fired mode. Or, oh my God, relationships are so hard. It must be because I don't deserve love, and I'm going to be alone forever mode. (laughs) But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. And a therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. Yes, and Beth and I have had our own personal experience with therapy and have yep. found it to be so helpful. Yeah, a therapist can help with unloading stress, emotional healing, as well as help with anxiety and depression. I was just thinking Marvin Gaye, emotional <laughs> healing. That's not the script. But if you are thinking of giving therapy a try or thinking of getting back into therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Yes, and you can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey. And no worries, you can switch therapist at any time. And when you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash fruit today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash fruit. Now we're going to get into Alonzo Robinson's early life. What do you got for us, Beth? It's been reported that Alonzo Robinson was born into poverty in 1895 in Cleveland, Mississippi. Nothing else is really known about his childhood. Hmm. Uh, Robinson grew to be six foot four and 240 pounds, so he was a big guy. Yeah. He served in the engineering corps in the Army and was possibly a World War I veteran, but we couldn't confirm. Not for sure. Yeah. Uh, so Robinson was reported 
reportedly first arrested in 1918 for mailing obscene letters to local women. Oh, no. But he managed to escape while en route to jail, sustaining a bullet injury to his shoulder. We were unable to corroborate this story in any local newspapers at the time. And the one reference to this incident that we could find told that Robinson left Mississippi after a farmer shot him for writing an obscene letter to his wife. Yeah, so we're not really sure, but that's, those are the two stories that have been reported. Yeah, and I wanted to say that uh, a lot of the articles and even to this day, like the New York Times and the L.A. Times get a lot of their information from the police. Uh-huh. And so you just just you have to know that in order to I, I think it's an important thing to know whenever we're talking about reports, say this or reports, say that um, and then a lot of the information comes from police. So, yeah. Okay. And they can't be trusted. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we should also say that there are a lot of stories surrounding Robinson. Uh-huh. The newspapers at the time sensationalized everything. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the reporting back then. Uh, fact check what? <laughs> So it was a little hard to dope out what actually happened. Mm -hmm. In addition, a lot of the modern stories on the Internet about Mm -hmm. him are misleading. It's like they play a game of telephone and the um, facts keep changing. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. A game of telephone. Yeah. Every, and and, and so the, some of the sources that I um, referred to commented on that. And so yeah. I, I, you sort of kind of know that going into this story. Right. That... And it, this happens a lot with old stories. Yeah. But we did the best we could. Yeah. Forgive us. Yes. yes. <laughs> In any case, Robinson then moved to Michigan, where he went by the alias of James H. Coiner. So now we're going to get into the timeline. Hit it, Beth. In 1925, the city of Toledo, Ohio, was terrorized by an unknown perpetrator that the media dubbed the Toledo Clubber. The attacks happened in the upscale West End area of Toledo, later referred to in the press as the Clubber District. And again, not the fun kind of clubber. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, want to go to the clubber district this Thursday? (laughs) Ladies get in free. (laughs) So uh, the the Toledo clubber used a uh, heavy bludgeoning type objects to hit his victims from behind and then continue to smash their faces and skulls. Some witnesses described the man as having red rings painted around his eyes. One victim said his face was painted red with black rings around his eyes. Well, that would be fucking terrifying. Wait a minute. Did I say the same thing twice? Uh, well, one of them says they were just rings around his eyes oh, with red. Oh, okay. okay. And the other okay. one said his face was painted red and had black with rings black around rings. his okay. eyes. Okay. Yeah. I just yeah. confused myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Another hallmark of this perpetrator is that he often laughed during his attack. Oh, my God. A laugh that has been described as evil and maniacal. He was wow. described as tall and wild looking with bloodshot eyes and superhuman strength. Because this is thriller. <laughs> it reminds me, you know, the, the laugh in the thriller song? Oh, the, yeah. <laughs> and the <laughs> When I was a kid, I... I couldn't listen to that. Podcast. It was pretty I just scary. Had to turn yeah. off the radio. Yeah. Be- and that's what I imagine. Right. So his first victim was Emma Hatfield, 48. On the evening of May 24th, 1925, Emma was walking home from her sister's house when she was attacked. She was found the next morning in an alley. She was still alive and was hospitalized, but died four months later. She was unable to describe her attacker. An eyewitness said he saw a nude man fleeing the scene. And this is the only reference to a nude man. So, Oh, interesting. Okay. On August 21st, Lydia Baumgartner, 24, and a mother of two, was found dead in between two houses near the spot where Emma had been found. Her skull had been crushed and she'd nearly been decapitated. And that's just from the beating. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So her husband was arrested, but he was later released. Okay. So on October 20th, a woman identified in most articles as Mrs. Frank Hall 
but in one publication as Beth Hall, left her home to mail a letter when she was attacked. She later said that a shadowy figure emerged from the dark and clubbed her on the head. As she screamed and raised her arms to ward off a second blow, the attacker was startled by something and ran off. She later said that as he fled, he emitted an evil and maniacal laugh. She described him as having a dark complexion. Wow. So, wait a minute. This sounds nuts. Yeah, Uh, terrifying. Like, the whole scene, yeah. On November 16th, Wilma Holdley, a 24-year-old telephone operator, was walking home when a quote-unquote giant emerged from behind a tree and struck her in the head. She fell to the ground as the attacker continued to club her. When a car turned the corner onto the street with headlights glaring, the attacker fled. Wilma survived. She described her attacker as wearing red face paint, saying he laughed as he attacked her. Yikes. Oh, don't like this. <laughs> November 18th, Frida Dreham, 30, was walking home from her sister's house when a figure emerged from behind a tree and attacked her, fracturing her skull. The attacker again fled after a witness ran to the woman's aid, screaming. Oh. As the attacker fled, he was laughing maniacally. Wow. Frida survived. Wow. On November 19th, Cora Batchelor, 33, who worked for the phone company Ohio Bell, was attacked while walking near her home. She survived and later said that her attacker laughed before he struck her. On November 21st, Catherine Knight, 23, was attacked at about a quarter to nine when she went outside to empty the garbage. She survived. Then the same night at about 10 o'clock and about two miles away, Pauline Winover was attacked while sitting in a car waiting for her male companion who'd gone into a store. A man was witnessed following three women down the street when he stopped suddenly as he came abreast of the car that Pauline was sitting in. He pulled open the car door and tried to drag her out and hit her in the head with a club, but hit the top of her car instead. Witnesses ran to Pauline's aid and the attacker fled up a stairway, then across rooftops, and he got away. Yeah. Pauline was not seriously hurt. She said the perpetrator's eyes were painted black and his face was smeared with red paint. On November 22nd, Mary Lauren Braun, 18, was found unconscious in the street a block from her home after attending a football game. There were bruise marks on her throat and a knot on her head. She later said that she was grabbed from behind and when she screamed, she was choked and then struck in the head with a club. Mm -hmm. One publication said that red and black paint were found on her clothing. However, police denied that she was a victim of the clubber and they claimed that she'd probably been thrown from a car. (laughs) It's fine. Somebody just threw her from a car. Yeah, no. (laughs) Don't be Um, worried, Toledo. It's fine. Everything's fine. Right? We're police officers. We keep everybody safe. No, no cause for alarm. This is just a, you know. You know, as one does, gets thrown from cars. <laughs> um, so the people of Toledo were terrified. The American Legion put 1,000 ex-servicemen on the streets to patrol the city. Escorts, which included Boy Scouts working in pairs, were provided to women who were now afraid to walk alone at night. High school boys working in groups of 10 also patrolled the streets and provided escort services. Police women walked the streets wearing hats lined with steel. Wow. As backup followed them discreetly behind hoping to lure out the attacker hats lined with steel yeah i don't think i've ever heard of anything like that before in my (laughs) life a man was shot as he approached a home he had the wrong address luckily the bullet just grazed him and he wasn't seriously hurt another man was almost killed when police were pursuing a suspect The press published theories on who the man was, one of the most prevalent being that he was a quote-unquote madman who escaped the Toledo Insane Asylum. Mm. A profile of the clubber claimed that he was a giant man of superhuman strength and that he was beast-like with fiery eyes. Way to terrify the populace. Seriously. And yeah. um, to put it on people who were getting mental health treatment in an asylum, because asylum, mm-hmm. we don't have asylums anymore or right, right. many mental health institutions. And part of me wonders if this kind of propaganda and reporting had something to do with it. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't <laughs> I'm know just, either. I'm but just, yeah. Uh, 
Putting it out there. I'm curious. So women stopped going out after dark if they could help it. Businessmen complained that the clubber was ruining business. How dare he? (laughs) Police denied many of the women's stories. Of course they did. Uh, They can't even serve on juries, for God's sakes. (laughs) Claiming they were hysterical. Oh, my God. I hate that word. It Mm -hmm. makes my blood boil. And imagining things and falling all over the place, bumping (laughs) their heads. Fuck you. Oh, my God. (laughs) Wow. Many suspects were brought in, but nothing panned out. Tips flooded the police station, but none ended in an arrest or a serious suspect. A drawing was made of the perpetrator described as a white man with a hooked nose and protruding front teeth, and it's nuts. (laughs) Wow. It's very cartoonish, and it reminds me of the anti-Semitic propaganda put out by the Nazis during World War II. That's exactly what it sounds like. Already, yeah. in, in the span of these these women being attacked and hurt, they're blaming crazy women. Yep. They're blaming uh, mentally ill people. And yep. they're blaming, um, oh, uh, Jewish people. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's everybody. They're doing everything but trying to figure out the problem Ooh, and solve it. This, yeah. yeah. What the <laughs> fuck? You guys see what a waste these sons of bitches in uniforms are? <laughs> So on January 19th, 1926, Mary Handley, age ranges given um, in uh, reports, were from age 42 to 49, was found dead in her neighbor's yard, gagged with her own torn clothing and her head smashed in. It was believed that she was clubbed on the sidewalk in front of her home and then dragged in between the houses. On the evening of October 26, 1926, Lily Croy, a school teacher, left the University of Ohio, where she was taking classes, to walk home. At about 1.30 a.m., her body was found under the fire escape of a public school. Mm. She'd been hit in the head at least three times, crushing her skull. Her clothes had been cut off and she'd been criminally assaulted, which was a euphemism at the time for rape. After the murders of Mary Handley and Lily Croy, the clubbings ended. To this day, the case has never been solved. But on May 29, 1928, a seven-year-old girl was kidnapped from her bed. Her body was found having been beaten about the head strangled and criminally assaulted. A man named Charles Hope was arrested and he admitted to the murder and the murder of Lily Croy, but denied being the Toledo clubber. He was convicted of the little girl's murder, sentenced to death, and executed by electric chair. Ooh, it is likely that Hope was not the Toledo clubber, as the perpetrator in those cases did not rape the women, just beat them. Oh, he just beat them. Yeah, <laughs> just beat them. No. It's okay. Uh, it's, it's cool. It's, it's we're just good. making the distinction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it is probable that the clubber murders ended with Mary Handley, or Mary Handley may have been murdered by Hope or someone else. In the fall of 1926, some boys came across the body of a white woman in the basement of an empty house in Hammond, Indiana. The body was that of Grace C., who had been taken from her grave the previous day. Whoa! Yeah. Police watched the house, and when a man turned up to it, they arrested him. It was Robinson, going by the name of James H. Coiner. Ooh, we see you, Alonzo. So Robinson told police that he, quote, just wanted the woman to look at, unquote. (laughs) Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, there's (laughs) photographs. There's also the women are 50 percent of the population. So you look somewhere. They're somewhere around. They're around. Yeah. Yeah. He was convicted of grave robbing and sent to the state penitentiary in Indiana on a 10-year sentence. 10 oh my God. years for grave robbing. Yeah. Wow. wow. I I don't I wonder if the sentence is still kind of the same this to this day. Also, I, know. I recently heard a podcast kind of unrelated about human composting and how it's better for the planet to compost your loved ones instead of cremating them or burying them in a casket. Now, I haven't officially looked into it, but I really like the idea. Anyway, 
Yeah. Yeah. On February 11th, 1927, the skulls of four women were found in the attic of a house in Royal Oak, Michigan, near Ferndale, by the children who lived there. Oh. They had been playing in the attic when they discovered the skulls, wrapped in newspapers what? at the bottom of a trunk and covered with an army uniform. Holy shit. <laughs> this, this happened You're in... Like, oh, I wish I was I there. Know. Seriously. <laughs> um, th- it would have been the greatest day of my life. <laughs> but... um. Oh my God. I just, oh, I have an attic and I want to go up there now to see to if see I if might there's any skulls find up there. any skulls and I can <laughs> reopen a cold case or something, you know? <laughs> so um, braids of bloody hair and a notebook were found with the skulls. The notebook contained a list of prominent women's names from Detroit and Pittsburgh and phone numbers were penciled in beside them. The word white was written next to some of them. The current occupants were the Wilsons, a black family that had moved in in November 1926. It was assumed that the trunk had been left in the attic by the previous occupant, who was Robinson, going by James Coiner. Ooh, now many modern articles claim that around this time, run about that time, (laughs) headless bodies began popping up all over town. But that's not true. Oh, it's <laughs> not true. There were some body parts that were found, but they were of two men, and that crime was solved. So, but on February 11th, 1927, the torso of a woman was found on the banks of the St. Joseph's River in South Bend, Indiana. It was speculated that she could have been in the water for as long as six months. Oh my God. Yeah. Officials thought the body could have been thrown into the river further upstream from one of several towns in Michigan or Indiana. Now, I should also say that around, I don't know if there's a university around here, but um, medical students um, and buying cadavers was expensive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I think people did around this time rob graves for medical purposes and and, and that kind of thing. So there were cases of that. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as we can tell, authorities concluded that the women, the woman was thrown into the river after dying from an illegal operation, a euphemism for an abortion. Mm-hmm. Whoa, I've never seen that before. And the body had been broken up while in the river. So she probably was not related to the Robinson case. Robinson was questioned at the Indiana prison about the skulls that had been found in the trunk. He denied any connection to them. <laughs> he allegedly said, quote, I could tell you a lot of things you'd like to know. A lot of things about murder and murderers. But I'll die first. Unquote. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> Existing evidence was insufficient to support a murder charge. But the bodies were in his trunk, though. So The skulls. The skulls. The skulls. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. And um, okay. it's my opinion they're probably from a graves, but I don't really know. Oh. Okay, at this time, right about that time, (laughs) the idea was floated around that maybe Robinson was the Toledo clubber. Hmm. Newspapers reported that he told officers he was living in Toledo at the time and that he fit the description of being a large man. The funny thing is that the description at the time of the attacks was that of a white man with a hooked nose. Oh, we're just going to change our bad guy. Yeah, Don't worry yeah. About Don't worry, worry about, about the it. details. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't worry your pretty little <laughs> yeah, head. Yeah. It's fine. It's, it's fine. <laughs> we didn't see any articles saying it was a black man. And just one victim said that he had a dark complexion. And when people back then said dark complexion, they weren't talking about black people. Really? (laughs) I don't think so. I think they were talking about, you know, maybe um, Italians or maybe Latinx people. Yeah. I think I think if they if the person was black, they would have said Negro. Colored or Negro. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. You're right. You're right. Thank you, friend. But suddenly now newspapers were reporting that the description was that of a Negro. Well, it's easier to sell yeah. newspapers yeah, that way, and, especially and, you when know. you scare people. Yes, right? and let's just and pin it on the black guy. Let's pin it on the black guy. And let's be honest, um, because of segregation and all the systems in place in this nation of ours, uh, not a lot of white people know black people other than when they are in service to them. True. So they don't really know them as human beings. True. And especially at this point, time. Yeah. So it's 
scary if you if you're the unknown might right. be doing something scary. So yeah. the newspapers even back then capitalize on people's fears. Yeah. Um. So but this idea that he might be the Toledo clubber did not seem to go anywhere. Paroled in July of 1934, Robinson, as James Coiner, returned to Cleveland, Mississippi. There, he again began writing and sending obscene letters to women. On December 9th, 1934, 10-year-old Merlene Turner, after spending the night at her grandparents' house, returned home to find that her parents had been murdered, and she ran to a neighbor's house for help. The killer had used a hammer to beat Aurelius B. Turner and his wife to death. Mr. Turner had been shot in the head with a 38. Aurelius Jr., their four-year-old son, had been hit over the head and knocked unconscious, but he survived. Their two-year-old son, Jimmy, was left in his crib unharmed. Mrs. Turner had also been disemboweled. Whoa! She was pregnant and the fetus had been removed and placed on the bed next to her. Oh, my God. Her lower body had been mutilated with chunks of flesh sliced off and taken away by the killer. Oh, my God. That is horrifying. Yeah. Um, I... I, maybe I should save it for my takeaways, but disemboweled is one of my favorite words in the English <laughs> language. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It just is. Now, initially, a man named Rufus Lee Roy was arrested in connection to the murders. He was later released, though. So now we're going to get into the investigation and the arrest. What the what, Beth? A postal inspector was in Cleveland investigating the obscene letters postmarked from Cleveland, some of which were threatening. Women in both Cleveland and Indianapolis had been receiving these letters. The inspector believed that the perpetrator was a Cleveland resident who was getting the names of prominent women in Indianapolis from the Indianapolis newspaper. This was due to the fact that one of the letters had been sent to a woman whose address had been misprinted in the paper, and the perpetrator had used that same incorrect address. After the Turner murders, a woman in Cleveland received an obscene letter, but this one was a little different. The writer claimed that he had killed the Turners and then said, quote, you're next, unquote. Uh oh, Ooh, that'd be terrifying. That is terrifying. Have you been watching The Watcher? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah, that's what that reminds me of. <laughs> so the inspector learned that a James Coiner subscribed to the Indianapolis paper, which was being delivered to a post office box in Shaw, Mississippi. And officers were waiting for him when he came to get his mail on January 12th, 1935. He at first resisted until one of the officers punched him in the face. Problem solved. Yeah, yeah. A search of his pockets revealed a 38 pistol, a pocket watch, three obscene letters, and a piece of jerky in an envelope. When officers searched his room at his mother's house where he was staying, they found 52. 52? 52 more obscene Wait a minute. letters. Alonzo wrote the other 52. <laughs> Oh, uh, this guy really likes obscene letters. Really, wow. really like them. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, a packet of human hair in wow. Mrs. Turner's color, oh. blood stained boots, and more meat, salted and preserved like jerky. One piece bore teeth marks. Wow. That is. Interesting gross. and damning and gross and so many <laughs> so many bad things in yeah. one little package. Yeah. Now it soon it was soon discovered that the meat was actually human flesh. The pocket watch belonged to Mr. Turner. Mr. and Mrs. Turner's bodies were exhumed in order to compare the flesh removed from Mrs. Turner to the jerky found with Robinson. Oh my God! Wow. wow. In custody at Hines County Jail, which is described in the press as mob proof. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that which was important back then because of all the lynchings. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you yeah. said that. Robinson denied being involved in the Turner's murders, but admitted to ownership of the skulls found in Michigan. He claimed they'd been taken from graves. When you said mob proof, I, I, the reason why I said wow, I was, I thought it meant mob like 
the, the ma- mafia. The, ma- the mafia can't escape. It's escape. Oh, group. I see. Wasn't I see. Capone like? I don't know. Weren't the mafia guys like well known for getting out of jail, like I escaping? Don't I, I, don't I don't know. I don't know. In my head, yeah. they are. I don't yeah. know if it's true. <laughs> now, <laughs> <Mom> when <laughs> when police threatened to charge his mother in the crimes as well, Robinson confessed. When asked why he killed the Turners, he said, "Quote." I just had the impulse to kill somebody, unquote. Oh, just 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 yeah, a Tuesday. I just you felt pour, like it. Yeah, you pour your favorite glass of whatever, you get your snacks, and then you get an impulse to, to kill somebody. Kill somebody. No big yeah. deal. So he said he cut the flesh off of Mrs. Turner because he quote wanted to see how it would feel, unquote. Okay. Okay. Mm, okay. The local newspaper proclaimed Robinson, quote, admitted that he was a sex pervert, which is considered to be the underlying cause for the crime, unquote. Okay. All right. Well, now we're going to get into trial. Okay. I'll tell you what happened on that trial. On February 14th, 1935, Robinson was tried and convicted in one damn day for a murder trial of multiple people. Yeah. Huh? And the jury deliberated for just five minutes yep. and he was sentenced to death. Boom. So got him. Yeah. So <laughs> and now we're going to get into where are they now? Tell us, Beth. On March 5th, 1935, Robinson was executed by hanging at the Bolivar County Jail as 200 to 300 National Guardsmen with fixed bayonets stood wow. guard outside the jail. I think they were expecting a mob. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. And apparently the gallows was located on the roof of the jail. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Now we're going to get into our takeaways and what we think made him snap. What do you got, Beth? Well, obviously this guy had uh, issues. (laughs) Yes. Yes, indeed. We can probably trace back a lot of it to racism and how people of color were treated during this time. Generational trauma, all that stuff. Yeah. But he seemed to have a lot of anger towards women in general. And I don't know if it's because of something that was done to him by a woman or women Mm -hmm. like his mother, grandmother, something like that. Or just because he was heterosexual and women were his target. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reminded of Jeffrey Dahmer, not just the cannibalism aspect, but how this guy collected skulls. Yes. Dahmer collected skulls and body parts because he couldn't form normal relationships with people and it made him feel close to them. Yeah, and, and he was afraid of rejection. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I, I suspect it's the same with this guy. Yeah. And, I mean, he's writing obscene letters. Um, mm-hmm. It seems like a form of communication or something. I yeah, don't know. like he's reaching out, doesn't mm-hmm. really know how to do it properly or right. in a way that we would consider normal. Nor- yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, or acceptable, and right. um, but but he's but he's tr- it's like he's trying, but doesn't. <laughs> but he's do all it. fucked up, so he's, he can't. It, it's doing it in a really yeah, really. really if, weird if somebody way. had just said, "What is it you need? Yeah. Here's how you do it." Like this is why we talk about things. <laughs> yeah. And it seemed like his crimes escalated quickly from grave robbing to murder. And I wouldn't be surprised if he'd committed other murders. And maybe the skulls were Mm -hmm. of women he murdered, but I suspect they were from graves. I don't really know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard to say. But Um, I do think it's very possible that he killed other people. I could not agree more. (laughs) Yeah. And it's wild how the Toledo Clubber went from a white suspect to a black suspect when they had a guy in custody. Oh, my God. Custody who was doing strange things and he was black. (laughs) Yeah. Is this guy some sort of mutant because he went from a a white guy guy to a black guy? A a white guy to an insane person to (laughs) paint on his face. And then it's it's, really he was a boogeyman. He was whatever... Whatever Whatever the media needed him to be to explain away these terrible things and also sell all the newspapers. Yes, (laughs) yes, that too. (laughs) (laughs) Also, I want to say that I tried really hard to find out the name of Aurelius B. Turner's wife. Yeah. But she was only ever referred to as Mrs. Turner or Aurelius B. Turner's wife. Wow. So uh, thanks, misogyny. (laughs) Oh, Fred. Of Turner. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it, it happened a lot in the papers. They, 
women were referred to by their husband's name. Wow. Look at that. Mm, mm, mm. So thank you, Beth. I agree with all of your takes. And I really think that they are. um, I'm impressed. Chef's kiss. (laughs) Well done, my smart friend over there. Um, I think that this guy, what you what he engaged in, we might call today Internet trolling. (laughs) <laughs> but before we had a word for what trolling yeah, was, he's yeah. a troll. Yeah. Um, and trolls, I mean, now that I say this out loud, when you think about it, trolls are really like lonely people on the internet who on are their angry. bridges who are angry yeah. and looking for something, right? They yeah. want you to engage with them. They want you to react yeah. to their That's a really comments good point. or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that just kind of kind of links up with your point about him wanting connection. wanting something, some sort yeah. of connection. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to, I just had to say, if I haven't made it clear how baffled I am about glorifying the Roaring Twenties, <laughs> we just barely scratched the surface. But it wasn't the Roaring Twenties. It for wasn't everybody. great for yeah, a lot of people. It was a really yeah. hard time. Um, the reporting was clearly racist. Yeah. Um, and also, why isn't there a movie about this guy? Why isn't there more articles about this guy that Hello! aren't bullshit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 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 his victims. This case is so interesting yeah. and captivating. And um. Um, the, he he robbed graves. He's trolling. Yeah. He's trolling newspapers. He's cutting people's heads off. What? Yeah. And <laughs> um. Oh wait, I know why. It starts with an R and ends with yeah, an A. Yeah, yeah. Um. Also, this guy is super guilty. Yeah. And um, <laughs> the victims and their families deserve justice, whatever that looks like. Right. But the trial conviction and the sentencing happening so quick are troubling yeah. only because. It's only troubling because it happened to so many BIPOC people who were not guilty. Like we talked about the lynchings in the episode. Um, And there should be lots of true crime stories and pods to teach people about that ugly past America. But I don't know. Maybe we'll do a series on lynching. I don't know. (laughs) Um, But those stories are suppressed because they're really ugly and hard for America to Americans to talk about. Yeah, I mean, just just the the whole I I think it's mostly in the South, but in other places, too, people trying to suppress Mm -hmm. history now. Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't want their white children to learn about uh, racism and slavery yeah. because it might make them feel bad. Uncom- <laughs> um, it makes them feel uncomfortable. Well, imagine having, uh, you know, uh, imagine, imagine living, living through it. Or you ha- through yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, my God. It just yeah. it's, it, that baffles me. That yeah. baffles me. Yeah. 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 And you have to you have to name it you have to identify it you have to talk talk about about it so it it. doesn't happen anymore because lynchings are still happening to this day i mean we're being honest through the the all the things that happen in the 20s a lot of Mm -hmm. those things are still happening today it's like 100 years later repeating history yeah are we are we that are we that much better? I mean, we have smartphones. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's it's definitely yeah. better. It's definitely better, but it, um we're still dealing with the same issues. Right, because we haven't reckoned with what the with the truth, really. Yes. of, of yes. what who we are as uh, American human people. Right. Okay, well now it's time for how not to get murdered. <clears throat> so, if you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. <laughs> <laughs> this segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. All right. So I just wanted to shout out to Kimberly Ann on IG who shared a video with us um, posted by a dude on Instagram and his name is Zach Micho and um, she, said, hey, she said hey granted he is a cis white guy but the tip is specifically for the good men and male identifying and male presenting folks out there. If you see a woman walking on the street just cross it. Do what you can to prevent her from feeling uncomfortable and tell your friends to do the same thing to keep that same energy. Wow. That is a really awesome tip. That's I love what it. I thought. I love it. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and hip hop air horns. Because- <laughs> <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. I thought that was a really great tip. Yeah, it is. Um, so now it's shout out time where we shout out any right content on. by or about any people of color, any othered or marginalized folks, or any true crime goodies. I have two, friend. Okay. Um, the Watcher. Yeah. Based on a true story. <laughs> and it's so creepy. <laughs> um, and it's on Netflix. Yeah. And also a podcast called A Tradition of Violence about, I don't know if you've heard of this, the deputy gangs I in LA. I started listening to this one and it is really terrifying. Yeah. It is. It is. And they've been operating in the past 50 years. It's They're evil human yeah. beings they hunt human beings there was one story uh her name is cerise castle she's the journalist who broke the story she's a mm-hmm. woman of color i think she's um a black woman but I, I but anyway she's a woman of color she was saying she interviewed somebody who the deputies just for fun jumped on somebody's legs to break them oh my god <laughs> and, and then arrested them like what it, yeah. it, the, the the level of violence they will just kill you and get away with it yeah and it is really scary the la sheriff's department by the way are not the only police department in our country like this yeah so um that's uh what i got what do you got well, I wanted to shout out Pretty Hard Cases on Amazon Freebie. What? Amazon Freebie? Do yeah. Do I have to download a new service and no, pay well, for I it? Don't, I don't know. Um, it just started appearing. So I use uh, Fire Stick to, to watch oh, yeah. TV. Me too. Uh, and it uh-huh. just it just appeared. It just popped up. It just popped up. And now there's stuff on there. So... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how Beth that Bezos, happened. Get but out there of Beth's you go. living room. <laughs> but it, the show is called Pretty Hard Cases. It's a Canadian okay. show. Okay. Uh, police procedural comedy. Oh. And whoa, the, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. So like... Uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine style? No, it's not quite as I, I. I guess it's more of a comedy drama. It's not okay. quite as comedy as uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. Okay, got you, got you. The two main characters are women, a mm-hmm. white lady and a black lady. Mm-hmm. They're both detectives, but their personalities are very different. So it's kind of uh-huh. like an odd couple kind of thing. Okay, cool, cool. And they become friends and work cases together, and it's it's cute. But okay. there's also, you know, some drama and stuff, too. And I, yeah. I don't know. I really like it. I like it. It sounds low stakes and yes. like you can kind yeah. of turn your brain off, you, yep. which is great And you don't right have to. And it's not stressful because sometimes yes. I can't watch stressful things. Oh, uh, tell yeah. me about it. Tell me about it. Yes. Oh, thank you. Sure. And then Unsolved Mysteries Season 3 is out on Netflix. Woo! <laughs> I just ascended through the ceiling. <laughs> I am so excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there you go. Fantastic. So just to recap, that is The Watcher on Netflix, a podcast called A His- a Tradition of Violence, wherever you get your podcast, Pretty Hard Cases on Amazon Freebie, and Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. Yeah. I'm so sad. I get yeah. so sad every time we get to the <laughs> end. I, I mean, I know we're coming back and stuff, but I just get so sad. Yeah. But in the meantime... Where can the people find us, Beth? Our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. Join our discussion group on Facebook at Fruit Loops Pod Discussion. If you want to support the show, you can send us a donation on the Cash App. Just Google Fruit Loops Pod Cash App or you can become a monthly patron through Patreon. And as always, we have merch for sale on our website. That is all correct. Now, this is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. <laughs> Happy Halloween! <laughs> <laughs>
a news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read.